Um, hello, my name is Oleksy Grechnev, and today's talk is called uh, GStreamer for Computer Vision. I apologize for the noise from the nearby construction site, but there is little I can do about it, unfortunately. Uh, the story is like this. Uh, for years, I was interested in GStreamer, but didn't have time to learn it properly. Finally, I learned some GStreamer recently, and now I'm giving a lecture about it. Chapter one is introduction. What is GStreamer? Official site gives a rather short definition. It's an open source multimedia framework, while Wikipedia gives a much longer definition. GStreamer is a pipeline-based multimedia framework that links together a wide variety of media processing systems to complete complex workflows and so on, blah, blah, blah. GStreamer is a part of GNOME project. I don't really like GNOME desktop, but I like their libraries. And GStreamer is so successful, it's even used by Qt library and thus by KD desktop, which I'm using. Uh, what programming languages can be used? GStreamer is written in PUSC and not C++, but of course it's okay to use its C API from C++ code. It's based on GObject. It's an object-oriented pro programming framework uh, in C and GLib libraries. uses them a lot. So you will often have to free memory code and reference streamer to avoid memory leaks. This is important. What about any other programming languages? There used to be a C++ binding, GStreamer MM with nice C++ classes, but unfortunately it's not supported anymore. I think it's a great pity because such binding would be very nice. A Python binding should exist, but likewise I'm not sure if they support the most recent GStreamer version. If you want full support and the most recent version, make sure to use GStreamer in CA and CAPI. That's the real up to date GStreamer. What platforms can you run GStreamer on? It's in theory, it's cross platform. It's written in C, but it has tons of dependencies and uh, it wouldn't be easy to build from the source. Pre built libraries are available for all main uh, operating systems, such as Linux, Windows, Mac OS, mobile devices, and so on. Note that we could not find a pre built version for the web browser platform, Wasm Engine. It should be possible in theory, but apparently nobody wants such a big monster on such a weak and restricted platform. The next question is why GStreamer? Why do we want to use GStreamer? Why do we want to learn GStreamer? And the story goes like this. Suppose you are writing a computer code in, in computer vision or deep learning or something, and you want to process audio or video files of various formats. For example, you have quite a typical task. You can read a video process it and write the processed video. Or maybe the same with audio. Or maybe you want to write a custom media player as a simple example. Everybody who is processing video writes a media player sooner or later in their life, just as a test. But the question is, if we are writing a code, what libraries do we use to read or write audio or video file? People who know absolutely nothing about audio or video processing sometimes think it's easy. It's a big mistake. It's, it's not easy and it's really not easy. So what can we do? 
Some people could remember that they exist in a number of libraries for various formats and codecs. They are usually free and open source, such as LibX264, LibAAC, and so on. But of course, it's not a very good idea to learn and use such library. Every such library has its own original API, but there are dozens of different codecs and formats in the world. And then the users do not care about it. They, wa they want your product to read video in any format, and they are unhappy if it doesn't work. They don't even care that there are so many different formats. And of course, so somehow how we would like to read various audio and video format. Do we really want to write the custom logic, select, analyze the file, select an appropriate library like X264 or something? That's a rhetorical question. Probably not. What we want is one library to rule them all. A question, do you hear me? Is everything OK? Yes. So let me continue. At that point, fans of OpenCV usually stand up and say, how about OpenCV? But obviously, OpenCV is not the solution. The most important thing about OpenCV is cannot work with audio at all which means for any task related to audio, even if you just want to keep an audio track, OpenCV is out of question. It also has a very limited functionality. For example, we'll try to try, uh, for example, it can uh, read or write video files, but try to encode and decode in a network stream, or just uh, codec in computer memory. You cannot do like this. You can only work with with a disk file or URI when decoding, that's so. all. And, and most importantly, OpenCV itself is not, is not really a library for video codecs. It re itself relies on um, video backends, most often FFMPEG or GStreamer. And at this point, my question is, let's look. Is OpenCV relies on FFMPEG or GStreamer? Basically, OpenCV is just a wrapper. Do we really need the wrapper? Or do we really need OpenCV? Or maybe you, we can cut the middleman and learn to use FFMP or GStreamer directly. Of course, friends of OpenCV uh, will have absolutely opposite question. How uh, friends of OpenCV always want to build OpenCV with something where something could be GStreamer, Qt GUI, Qt or something. I have no comments about that. I have an opposite logic. And another option which can hear often, why don't we convert things externally? For example, people often think and people often do things like that. Okay, we have a video file. We can process it externally. We think like a FFMPEG in the terminal or maybe some kind of GUI video editor. For example, we can extract an audio track from the video into a separate WAV file, which is then compressed. We can also resample it to desired sample array. But, uh, if necessary, then we process it. You we can read the uh, video with, our, with OpenCV and you can read audio with uh, Libus and their file or something like that. And then we process, we write in the same format, audio and video separately. And then in there, we can put it back together, audio and video. <laughs> or for example, we could use FFMP or just streamer in the terminal and send data to our code via, via pipe you know, like vertical line character. And what can I say? This technology can work at purely research level, but it's so much trouble, you have to process every single input-output file. <laughs> and uh, would you really like to do to give this to a client, such kind of demo, where you have to process all input files, separate audio, video tracks, and so on? Do you want to really give it to your colleagues or testers? Probably not. We want a nice demos. And to get a nice demos, we have to work programmatically with video, audio and video files and read both audio and video track and so on.
how to do it we are back to the question one library to rule them all except in my case there is not one or two libraries to rule them all practically there are only two choices at least on linux platform and cross-platform approaches there might be other approaches unique to certain operating system but but there are only two cross-platform approaches first is g streamer and second f ffmpeg and they have quite different ideologies. GStreamer can build sophisticated high-level pipelines, but while FFMPEG is much lower level, it only has oper elementary operations like encoding, decoding, muxing, demuxing, and so on. Both of these libraries are essentially a wrapper which use tons of libraries under the hood for different codecs and formats such as libx264. Also known that GStreamer actually uses FFmpeg for some codecs and formats, so GStreamer is not fully independent. It user relies on FFmpeg as dependency. And both libraries can be used in our code in C or C++. How to choose between them? It depends on what you want. If you want to build your pipeline by hand, use FFmpeg, but then you will have to micromanage everything, such as queue synchronizations, memory usage, so on. And it's not so easy, especially if you want real time. Alternatively, you can use G3, where if you want the library to build a high-level pipeline, line and run it automatically for you. FFMPEG is interesting and uh, it would be, if you want, you can try to learn it, find some tutorial, it would be a nice experience. Uh, I, of course, did it years ago and used FFMPEG on a real project. But today we are going, in today's lecture, we are only going to talk about GStreamer, no more FFMPEG. G3. What is GStreamer again? Essentially, it's a pipeline library, like other pipeline libraries such as MediaPipe, but it's highly specialized not for generic data, but uh, audio and video data. Moreover, for audio and video data, it's mostly specialized for tasks not like computer vision, but video encoding and decoding, playback on screen, resampling, resizing, changing codecs and formats, quality, applying some kind of filters, special effects, and so on. Also, from the name, you could get an idea that it some, has something to do with network streaming. It's wrong. While, of course, GStreamer has a lot of plugins, among them there are plugins uh, such as RTSP. This is not the only function of GStreamer. The main function of GStreamer is created local pipelines on your computer. But the question is, we don't want to re record a video into some other codex or format. What we want is computer vision. Is it possible to use GStreamer uh, for computer vision? The spoiler is yes, and we'll talk about that today later. Here we show the typical GStreamer pipeline on this picture, and I'll introduce a bit of terminology. Pipeline consists of elements, large rectangles, which have pads, like input-output ports, the small blue rectangles. In GStreamer, they are called pads. Pads can be linked, like shown by arrows, and elements can be source, only output sync, only input or filter in the middle. Likewise, pads can be source, output ports, and sync input ports. Uh, this is a standard GStreamer terminology as you see everywhere in GStreamer. And pipeline itself has a global state which can be play, pause, ready, and so on, like in a video player. And GStreamer pads have capabilities called or caps in GStreamer slang. Caps can be represented in a text stream. Example caps for raw video um, of BGR format with width and height or a raw 16-bit integer audio, quite typical caps. Note that GStreamer types and GStreamer caps are not MIME types, even if they look similar. 
<laughs> what do cabs do when they are linking two pets their cabs are negotiated it's automatic process by just streamer in other words the two elements agree on some kind of format very precise format for example settle width and height which satisfies both elements we format uh, image size frame rate and so on and so forth if the two pets fail to negotiate the linking fails and you uh, get an error the pipeline cannot play sometimes uh, if negotiations fail you can put element like audio convert or video convert in the middle which helps negotiations for example it can change for but from youth to bgr or vice versa chapter 2 of today's lecture G streamer and terminal while we, uh, we are interested in programming actually you can start learning G streamer without any programming why because G streamer has a number of tools uh, which can which can run G streamer pipelines from terminal it's uh, it doesn't give you a full knowledge of G streamer but it's helpful to learn some basics of elements and maybe even caps but don't try to you this for real projects for real projects please use your streamer as a c library there are a number of tools gst launch creates and launches a pipeline that's what we want gst play plays a media file as a video player gst inspect inspects available g streamer plugins installed while gst discoverer analyzes the detail codex formats of a given media file we are interested in GST launch. GST launch is called with a pipeline as a text stream. Pipeline as a text stream has a number of elements like Lego, Le bricks used to construct it with exclamation character between these elements to leave if you want to automatically link two elements. If you don't want to link, put space instead. Simplest pipeline consists of one element, high, really high level, just stream element called play beam it requires uri or absolute pass and it can play play a file as a video player on your computer there are also test audio and video sources and you can play them with automatic audio and video sync on your computer and uh, and let's uh, and it's a good idea to put to audio convert audio resample and video convert in the middle to to ensure that negotiations is successful because automatic things can have different uh, caps on different computers you can also give an option like pattern 18 let's try this in action try this take the second comment uh, copy <laughs> paste you see here here is a test video source and automatic video sync displays it on your computer it works let's go back to our presentation Ne and of course I encourage you when this lecture is finished to try these things on your computer. It can be funny to play with JG streamer pipelines and terminal if you uh, it's funny, it's entertaining, and you can really learn things like that. Um, what does this pipeline mean? There are things and sources, automatic audio and video sync are the things on your platform, which can be platform dependent, which shows stuff on your screen and your headphones and test sources they produce test audio and video and uh, conversion element you can put in the middle you can change format if needed uh, change audio format if needed for example from integer to float audio resample can resample audio to different sample rate if needed if two elements cannot negotiate put such elements between them and usually you can solve the negotiation issue G streamer pipeline can be visualized with GraphViz software. Here you can see an example. It's a really large image with a lot of information, caps and uh, uh, pads and everything like this. And auto video sync actually becomes a platform dependent XV image sync. And see, it's like this high level elements reduced to lower level element. You can see all with this visualization. 
Next topic is a branching pipeline. Sometimes your pipeline is not strictly linear, but should be branched. For example, here we have test video source, video convert, and then you branch pipeline using elements named T. And we give elements, so T is type of element, and we give it unique name, which is just a T character. Then you get Q, auto video sync, then you come back to element named t dot which means we come back to the same element we named previously t and note there is no exclamation sign but space before t because we are not linking then the second branch starts q auto video sync q is a buffer in g streamer terminology buffer is something else but q is called q element q it's often needed to avoid getting stuck to avoid deadlocks when using branching pipe Plans because the streamer doesn't check for deadlocks and they can easily be introduced by synchronization. Use Q to, to, to make, ensure a smooth operation without deadlock. Let's try in action this branched pipeline. Here you see it works. You get two uh, output syncs which show the same video. Next, we can use uh, URI decode bin and decode bin, which are high level decoding elements to play audio and video. They take some kind of input file or stream uh, with uh, encoded data and decode the mux them decode them and output raw audio and video tracks for example for example here we use uri decode bin to play to play a media file and then and then we have two branches <laughs> but this time the two branches are not created by T, but they come from URI decode bin. The first one is audio branch from URI decode bin to, to audio sync, and the second one video branch from URI decode bin to video sync. So let's see how it works. <laughs> You, pro you probably cannot hear the audio, maybe you can, but you can see the video, the playback works. Now, probably you showed the video, uh, you saw the video, but no audio, but I can assure you it works. Next. <laughs> Next, let's go really low level, because uh, the code bin is pretty high level element which analyzes the video file and automatically outputs, uh, automatically finds the correct uh, format and the, the, the mixers and decoders. But for, uh, for low level pipeline, you should find the mixers and decodes by yourself. Uh, for that, you should know your containers and codecs. Uh, if, uh, you can use GST Discoverer or FF Play in Terminal to analyze your file. For example, you know that your video has QuickTime uh, format uh, and, uh, and AAC audio codec and 264 video codec. Uh, just checking, is everything okay? Do you hear me? Yes. Can you see the screen? Let's okay. continue. Then you do pipeline is like this, file src uh, to, uh, to read the file. Then it goes to Qt demuxer, QuickTime demuxer. From QuickTime demuxer, there are two branches. First branch is, is uh, 264 decoder. By the way, AV means it's from FFmpeg. So FFmpeg is used here under the hood. Q and v video convert, video sync. And then the second branch is our, our audio decoder for AAC. And then again, Q converters and audio sync. Again, you need Q, probably need Q here to avoid deadlocks. And this pipeline also works. I shall not waste time running every pipeline on my computer, but I checked it works for one particular video, which has such, but only for one particular video, which has such format and codecs, because here we specified format and codecs. 
codex by hand. Now let's try encoding. It's not much harder. Here you take video of test video. We encoded with X264 encoding, mix it into every file and write into every file. For, for 265, you also need parser for some reason, but the technology is simple. And here we use Madroska mixer for, uh, to create an MKV. And another option, we use VP9 codex and mix it into WebM, a variation of Madroska, and, and write it into WebM file. For or you look at the examples here. For WAF, you don't need a mixer, only encoder. Same for MP3. For OGG, you need Vorbis encoder, OGG mixer. And the last example is for WMA. They all work checked. <laughs> now, now let's decode and re-encode. Here we take a WebM video. Uh, we decode it with the code bin into audio and we your track signals and then we have audio branch q audio convert encode in aac then we have second video branch q video convert encode with 264 then they, <coughs> they merge together Look how two pipelines merge together. You, the first branch goes into Muxer, every Mux element with name M, and second pipeline, uh, second branch starts with, with without exclamation sign, starts from D, the period, and goes into M period. That's how you do branch pipelines where branches rejoin. Not very difficult. The G streamer uh, pipeline string is quite powerful. Uh, before we finish with this chapter, a few extra pipeline tricks. You can specify the pad name when linking exactly. For example, D video zero pad name linked with exclamation sign to the next element. Of course, you must know the pad's name if you do like this. You can use caps filter. If you specify caps instead of element between two exclamation sign, then it's a caps field. Their negotiations fails if these caps are not satisfied. For example, video test testers see adjust to the type of output you expect from it. And uh, this, this caps filter forces video test SRC to adjust uh, to produce test video of particular size and format. Uh, we cannot set caps to video test SRC directly, but you can control it like that. Uh, later, we are going to use very important elements elements, app sync and app source. There you can both caps filter or explicit caps option of the element. The result is more or less the same. Another very important topic is synchronization and sync flag. Do we want to run our pipeline in real time or not? Many things have the option sync. If you if you put uh, option sync equal to true in auto video sync, which is default, the pipeline will be played in real time, one x speed. That's what you usually want for video player. On the other hand, uh, we, if uh, if you want to just some kind of processing from file to file, you don't want one X speed. You want to play as fast as possible. This corresponds to option sync equal false. You, if you if you put it uh, to auto video sync, you get a funny result as you can expect. Let's see. <laughs> You see, there is no synchronization. The video is playing very fast, as fast as computer can decode it. Um, back to slides. Sync option is very important for app sync, which you will see later. Finally, a couple of other topics which I put to this chapter uh, because there was nobody, nowhere else to put them. GStreamer and all in OpenCV. If and only if OpenCV is built with GStreamer, you can use GStreamer pipelines and uh, in video capture and video array there instead of a simple file name or URL. Of course, the pipeline should be terminated with AppSync or AppSource respectively. You don't 
get too excited. Friends of OpenCV, it's not a very good idea. Why it's bad? First, not every OpenCV build is built with just streamer, and and making custom builds is very annoying. Second, second only string pipelines, no code pipelines. So just streamer are supported. And the most important thing again, there is no audio, no no way to process audio. So basically, you gain nothing from such a streamer and OpenCV. You cannot use multiple sources or things in a single pipeline either. So don't do like that to use your streamer C API instead in your code. And second topic is NVIDIA deep stream. You might have heard of such a toy from NVIDIA. What is it? The NVIDIA deep stream is a streamer with some extra plugins from NVIDIA. It allows to run pipeline fully in GPU memory, supports GPU encoding and decoding on NVIDIA hardware, and neural network inference and tensor RT. It all works, of course, NVIDIA GPU only, strict and Linux only. It requires, like all toys from NVIDIA, it requires strict QD and QD and O versions. So, for all practical purposes, you can only run it in Docker on Linux host. I, I tried Hello World once, but I didn't go deep into software. I'm kind of allergic to TensorRT and uh, toys from NVIDIA. But if you like the idea, you can try it, can be fine Need to play with this software and Docker. Now we are finished with chapter two. It's about half of the lecture. And here comes chapter three. Finally, let's write some code in C++. GStreamer in C++. GStreamer has official documentation, which is pretty good. And there is also official tutorial, which is pretty good. I recommend this official tutorial. I am not trying to replace, but only to complement the official tutorial. If you, if you want really to understand GStreamer, my lecture is not enough for you need this official tutorial. No, it's nice, but I have a couple of comments. First, this tutorial is written entirely in PUSC, but in real life, you can, of course, use C++, and I do. And second, they really like to use GLib functions. I don't, and you don't have to. I wrote, while learning to streamer, I wrote my own tutorial, which is available on GitHub, which is co com not replaces, but complements the official tutorial, and it's focused on app source and app sync, and their usefulness for computer vision, audio processing, and such. And I highly recommend my tutorial after the official tutorial, or simultaneously, if you want to learn to streamer. <laughs> To add GStreamer to your C++ project, you have to install GStreamer dev version for Ubuntu or Debian, it looks something like this. For other operating systems, you have to improvise, and then you have to add it to your to your project. For Linux, uh, GStreamer is found with PKG config, which I can use from CMake project like that. Uh, usually, GStreamer is not enough. You also need additional modules like GStreamer audio, video, and app. For other, other operating systems might not have PKG config, then you'll have to do it in some other way. Uh, fun one in my GitHub tutorial is a more or less minimal GStreamer C++ example. First, if you are using GStreamer, you have to initialize GStreamer with code like this. Why do you need uh, GRC and ergv? More, moreover, with pointers because GStreamer uh, passes your uh, command line and uh, and passes all GStreamer specific flags. Moreover, it modifies RC to remove uh, the GStreamer specific flex, so you could after that pass your own options. I all some GStreamer flex are useful. I always use the flag GST debug level two. What does it give? It gives level two login, log warnings and errors by GStreamer and nothing else. If I don't put this flag, there is no login at all. So I always put this flag. If you put four, you get maximum verbosity, which is probably not a good idea. About two is optimal.
I also wrote my own assertion macro. Note that never ever use C plus plus a third statement. Why? Because in release build they will not work. Moreover, the whole line will be removed. So so never use uh, never you C plus plus assert. You write your own assert like I did, or maybe you can use CV assert and such. Next, we create pipeline from the stream, and, and you see that's where. Uh, the term our terminal experiments are useful you see when you are writing pipeline in in your code the pipeline stream looks exactly the same this this is hopefully familiar here for you but we do it programmatically in our c plus plus code we create pipeline stream then pass it into pipeline object by gst parse launch function it's very important to do error check with g error because the parse function tend to produce non-zero pipeline object even even if there is some error while passing so so you should always check the error after we created the pipeline we played and i forgot to say of course this example and all other examples are on github in the lecture i'm just giving some most important thing very briefly if you really want to learn look at the code we play the pipeline by setting its state of the pipeline element to the plane state there are several different states and the very end of the code you have to stop pipeline and release the pipeline first you stop it by say then it stayed to no and then you release it by gst object unref unref comes from reference count and is free in memory to streamer way more on that later is this all unfortunately not if you did it like that the pipeline would start playing and immediately stopped and destroyed the, there is nothing in the code to wait for the pipeline to finish we have to wait ourselves for the pipeline to finish and gstreamer doesn't have a main loop as such then where it then where does pipeline play there is no main loop in my code where does pipeline play and the answer is it play in different threads more on that later while in the main thread it will have to wait for the pipeline to finish how to do that each pipeline has a bus it's like a messaging system which have messages and in this example we, we get the bus of the pipeline by gst element get bus and then we wait indefinitely for an uh, end of stream or error messages ignoring all other messages with a function like this finally don't forget to release the memory unref message and unref the bus in fact in, in my next example, fun 2 cpp there is more advanced message handling, which we, where we process in a loop all kind of messages, not only end of stream or error, process in a loop, log them, and eventually put it into a separate thread. Look at my codes. No time for that. In next in the fun 2 cpp we show how to create pipeline by hand. Creating pipeline by passing a stream is nice, it's simple, and in 99% of the cases it's enough. However, we should learn how to create pipeline programmatically without passing a string. To do that, we use GST element factory make to create various elements. Then we create a new pipeline, set, set some option pairs of elements if needed with G object set, the setter of G object model. After that, we should add all elements to the empty pipeline. And after that, link all elements with GST element link menu. Note that you cannot always link static pads before you play the pipeline and you know the details like size of your image and things like frame and things like that. Uh, because of that, the streamer also has dynamic and request pads. No time for this in the lecture, see the official GStreamer tutorials. This thing can I explain there. <laughs> Memory management. I already mentioned that uh, during the streamer you have to be careful about memory leaks. Note that C and C++ doesn't have garbage collection and you generally have to take care of the memory itself. It's very important. Otherwise, uh, 
you get memory leak it's very very important because you have if you have memory leak in your code basically your code is not operational and cannot be used people who migrate to c++ from other languages tend to underestimate the danger in uh, in reality memory leak is very important and should be given high priority GStreamer is not even C++. It doesn't use knife switches like shared pointers. It uses C and G object and they're all in a memory model based on malloc and some reference counting. The general rule is like this. If you don't need object my banana anymore, what do you do? Try GST banana and ref my banana. If there is no such function, try GST object and ref my banana. If things get broken, then for some reason you shouldn't unref my banana if you do like this basically usually you should be okay with this stream I just don't forget to unref everything what about threads? I already mentioned that the streamer is multi-threaded it plays pipeline in multiple threads and not in main thread and it manages multiple threads under the hood automatically to run the pipeline in the most efficient way possible. Main thread is not blocked, you will have to wait for the pipeline to finish as we saw before. GStreamer is multi-threaded and in general rather thread safe. You can call GStreamer functions from any thread. There is no main loop as such. Some examples like examples from tutorial use glib main loop. I find it misleading because it can confuse the beginners. You, do, you absolutely don't have to use glib main loop. The only reason it's used is for one thing, watching the bus. If we watch the bus ourselves in the loop, as I showed you, you have to monitor the bus yourself, wait for the pipeline to finish, then you don't need that main loop. Likewise, you don't have to use any glib stuff, and it's perfectly fine to use C++ threads for everything in your code. Now we are finished with chapter 3, and the last and the final chapter is chapter 4, GStreamer for computer vision and audio processing, app source and app sync. Everything fine, do you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. Let's continue. Mm. The, how we state the problem? So far, we use standard GStreamer elements only, which have a lot of uh, funny things, even some special effects, but that's not what we want. We are programmers in computer vision and signal processing. We want custom audio and video processing in our C++ code. Can we do it in GStreamer? Yes. Sometimes we even want to use the streamer simply as decoder and encoder, not a full pipeline. There are two ways to solve this problem. The first approach is to write a custom GStreamer element. It's possible, but it's difficult, and I'm not going to teach it. The simpler way is to use app source and app sync elements, which is easy, and that's what we will do. You can see official tutorial section called Shortcut in the Pipeline, but it's rather brief. That's why I wrote my own tutorial to give much more in-depth introduction of uh, app source and app sync and how to use them. What are these two elements? You probably already guessed that's what they do. App sync is a sync which transfers data from, from the GStreamer pipeline to your C++ code so that you can work with this data data or data in your code. And that source is the opposite. It takes data from C++ code into the GStreamer pipeline. Data is usually raw audio and raw video. Of course, you can also use some codecs as data, but, but you probably don't want to. What you want in your C++ code to process raw audio uh, or raw video. You must always specify very precise caps when using app source and app scene. Note that unlike most G streamer elements, both app sync and app source have a built-in queue which can take a lot of memory. Sometimes you'll have to limit the queue because of that. 
they can be used in a number of ways, synchronous or asynchronous, uh, via signals or direct CAPI, I prefer the second option. We'll look at a couple of simplest examples, how to do it. The next example is video one from my tutorial. What does it do? It decodes video file with the streamer pipeline with the code bin, then convert it to raw BGR and sends to AppSync. And AppSync is our code which takes a frame and shows them on the screen with CVM show. The pipeline looks like this file source, decode a bin, convert, and AppSync. Now that AppSync has a lot of options. What do they do? The most important are caps. Here we demand raw video of BGR format. You see, we don't even have to convert RGB to BGR in OpenCV, which we usually do. And knowing that we're going to use OpenCV, we request BGR from the G streamer. And G streamer is smart enough to produce BGR if we ask for for BGR, video convert takes care of this. In this case, that's why video convert is important. We put sync one for real time uh, playback, one X speed. Uh, try for fun sync zero, you will get fast playback instead. Uh, max buffers is an example how to limit the queue size and the RAM usage. But be careful, but if, if uh, we be, be very careful when using this for branched pipelines, you could get a uh, deadlock with too small queue. Some code details. In this example, you can look in the code, but very briefly. I use two threads. Bus threads wait for the bus for end of stream. And the app sync processing thread put data packets in a loop from app sync and display them within show. Note that we use CAPI of app sync, not signal, and we pull packets synchronously in a loop. Note the once again, GStreamer data packet is called buffer. In GStreamer, the world buffer means data packet, never ever queue. For raw video, each buffer is exactly one video frame. We process uh, frames in a loop, and inside the loop, the code is approximately like this. We check for end of stream and exit the loop with end of stream. Then we went wait for the next sample. When the sample arrives, we can get sample caps. Not only you see not only pads, but samples also have caps to find the width and height of the frame. Then we get a buffer from the sample, which is basically another representation of the same raw image. And even buffer you cannot access directly. We need a special GStreamer structure called map to access the raw data in either read-only or read-write mode. And after we get map, we finally have a pointer to the raw data as M data. We can wrap it into a CV map and show it on the screen. After you show the frame on the screen, you don't need this data anymore. Don't forget to unmap the buffer and unwrap the sample, otherwise you'll get catastrophic memory leak inside the loop. That's all for video example one. You can look at the code and run it yourself if you want. The, the next example I'm going to show it video two. It's an EPS source example and it does completely the opposite. We read a video file with OpenCV and send it to GStreamer pipeline via app source, which and GStreamer pipeline displays it on the screen with GStreamer. The pipeline is like this, app source with a lot of options video convert or the video sync. What are the options? Caps as usual and also format time. You don't need it for video, but for some reason, then you absolutely must have it for the once I spend several hours trying to find out why nothing works, which I forgot this option for app source for audio. Um, this looks nice, but unfortunately, this pipeline will not work. Why? Because there are no width and height in the caps. The GStreamer will complain about no, that it doesn't know width and height. Uh, huh, what can we do? We don't know the width and height before we actually start receiving data. So what to do? The solution I did is we don't play the pipeline until our first frame arrived. And then the first frame memorized, we send up the proper caps from stream and renegotiate. 
now the pipeline when we change the caps pipeline negotiates again renegotiates and now it knows the frame size we do it every scene where pipeline is still not plain and only after that we we set pipeline to the plain state and it plays smoothly <laughs> now what do we do in the main loop we get a CV made frame from OpenCV. We convert it into a buffer by creating a new G streamer buffer, mapping it this time in right mode, using memcopy to copy data to the buffer and data, and mapping the buffer. Now we have the buffer with our frame. We can send it into SRC video with app SRC push buffer. But it's not all well, so we need to set up timestamp of the buffer it's very in streamer units it's very important if we do some kind of synchronization or play by in our case playback in one x speed you really need those timestamps and now the code uh, seems to work but uh, it's not really finished the problem is we're sending frames too fast as fast as we can read it uh, with open cv that fills up the queue and if video is large it will fill up the queue the whole memory and the system crash so what do we do what we want why don't we let the pipeline be smart the pipeline itself can tell us when it wants data and when it does doesn't want data. In GStreamer, it, uh, it's done like this. We use GSignal connect a glib function to register callback for the two signals of app source. G glib style callbacks for signals. The signals are called need data and enough data. And they simply set up a global flag. And this flag uh, regulates how does the, the main loop work. If the flag is false, we <laughs> We pause the main loop and you don't process process any frames for video capture it waiting. When the, this signal arrives, need data from the GStreamer pipeline, then you, the flag is set to true and then we start processing our frames again. So this why we let the pipeline to regulate itself when it needs data and when it doesn't smart. The, in my tutorial, there are more, more examples. I'll be very brief. Video 3 introduces two pipelines, the code video to AppSync, modify it with OpenCV, then encode it again from AppSRC. It's like combination of video 1 and 2. Look the code for more details. Audio 1 does the same, but for audio. Two pipelines, audio in the middle. And finally, my last example, AV1, audio and video example, which combines video 3 and audio 1. There uh, you have two pipelines, one for decoding, one to encoding, processing raw signals in the middle, and there are two raw signals, audio and video, respectively two app syncs and two app sources for audio and video, respectively. Now we are finished, our today's lecture is finished, and uh, what can I say? GStreamer is nice. Enjoy GStreamer for your encoding, decoding, and maybe building even more complicated pipelines. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maxine.